Lee, I've had this passion to really understand the universe and starting with physics uh, and with lots of other interests. But one subject that you keep coming across is, is symmetry and also symmetry breaking. And it's true in physics. It's true in art. It seems to be one of these general systems theories that pervades all aspects of, of reality and in terms of beauty, in terms of things that work. Uh, as a fundamental physicist, uh, how do you see symmetry and how do you work with it? Well, let me talk against symmetry. In fact, recently in Paris, I gave a talk called Against Symmetry. And this goes back to the idea that the properties of things are built up from relationships. This is the realization of Leibniz's conception of nature, which was then filtered through Mach and Einstein and is realized in contemporary theories of quantum gravity. And Leibniz had a principle of the identity of the indiscernible. If two things have exactly the same relationships to the rest of the universe, yeah. then they're actually identical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what this means is that fundamentally there are no symmetries. Yeah. Symmetries can be accidental, but there can't be, if there are two moments that look exactly the same, that have the same configuration, they have to be identified. If there are two places in the universe from which you see the same precise phenomena around you, they're identified. Identi okay. identical. Yeah. And this is realized in general relativity. If you study what are really the observable quantities in general relativity, the relational quantities of the kind that Leibniz talked about, and therefore the principle of the identity of the indiscernible is realized. So what I think about symmetry is that fundamentally, in the fundamental description, there are no symmetries. Symmetries emerge accidentally as approximations when the universe is very big. Let me give you an example. The symmetry of translation that the laws of physics are the same here as they are here is something that if you think of space as a consequence of a network of relationships can only be true approximately. But at the approximate level at which it's true, there are consequences of symmetry, for example, conservation. So conservation of momentum is a consequence of the hypothesis that the laws are the same here and there. Now, in general relativity that's realized perfectly, conservation of momentum is approximate and is only true to the extent to which there's a symmetry that says that you can move from this place of space to this place of space and the conditions don't change. Similarly, the conservation of energy is a consequence of the symmetry that the world doesn't change in time. But in general relativity, the world is always evolving in time, and conservation of energy is only approximately true. I, I think I understand what you're saying, but, but in the, the basic, the standard model of particle physics, we, there are symmetries. Things kind of look like they have some balance yes. and symmetries, and you're not saying that's accidental. I'm saying that it's a very useful idea, of course one doesn't know, but I'm suggesting that it may be that it's accidental, and it may be that the imperative, which I was certainly trained with, it's you know part of how many of us think, that to go more fundamental is to go more symmetric, yes. is wrong. Actually, the first person I heard say this was Roger Penrose when I was a graduate student, and I puzzled over it. He said when you go very, he was thinking about, for example, the symmetry of reversing the direction of space in a mirror or reversing the direction of time. And he said these things are probably just approximate. Indeed, we know they're violated in the fundamental elementary particle interactions just a little bit. And he suggested that the more and more fundamental you go, the less symmetries there are. And I puzzled over that for years until I started to read Leibniz, which was at the tutelage of Julian Barber, mm. and I understood where Roger was coming from. So, and, and of course, this is science, so you judge a philosophical idea by its success. And since the Standard Model in 1973, there has been no further unification by symmetries. Maybe there will be some, but the point of view that I'm suggesting is that ultimately we'll have a fundamental theory with no symmetries. The point of view that other people advocate is this old-fashioned idea that the more you unify, the more symmetries you have. And philosophy is, is very useful, but in the end, we'll see which idea inspires a theory that leads to real success. 
Sure, uh, but the concept of symmetry is also married to the concept of breaking symmetry. Even in, in, in macroscopic art, if something is perfectly symmetrical, it's really not very interesting. It's those subtle breaking of symmetries that create great art. And similarly, it seems in the world of physics that you need symmetries, but the breaking of symmetries in subtle ways that create all the, the uh, uh, possibilities that we see in, in the modern world. But you're saying something, I think, fundamentally different. You're saying that, that underneath, that this, is a, this is appearance or even illusion, that underneath that there's something that doesn't have symmetries that's generating this appearance almost as an artifact. Well, we know that that can happen from very, very large numbers. I mean, if you look in detail at the molecules in the air, if you look close enough, there's no symmetry from place to place. Right. Okay? But on the average, if you look roughly, there's roughly the same number of molecules in a right. large enough volume as right. enough. Right. So symmetry emerges when you lose information. Right. Right. And there is also the effect of spontaneous symmetry breaking. That's very fundamental in our understanding of the standard model. And both things in our understanding of science are operating. But fundamentally, see, I don't think, you know. So symmetry then would be an emergent property? Yes. As opposed to a fundamental property. And there has to be something more fundamental to generate the symmetry that itself is not symmetrical. Let's go back to the reasoning of Leibniz, because I really think that there was deep and fundamental reasoning done there which has had such an influence in the history of physics is worth paying attention to. And the reasoning was the basic principle is the principle of sufficient reason, that every question must have a rational answer, or the question is improper. You should not be able, in the correct understanding of nature, to ask a question that does not have a rational answer. Then Leibniz argued, if there is a symmetry, I'll put it in modern terms, then you can ask why is, let's say the symmetry is translation, then you can ask, why is the universe as a whole here and not translated 10 meters to the left? Because that's taking advantage of a symmetry of translation. And Leibniz said, if you have a theoretical structure and you can ask that question, but there couldn't possibly be a rational answer because all the phenomena are the same, because all the phenomena depend on relationships, on the distances between, then the question must be improper. And this is how Leibniz argued against symmetry. And and I believe that that's compelling reasoning because I see it carried out in the detailed understanding of how in general relativity we make contact between the mathematics and what's observable. So my belief is that in the end, symmetry is emergent. It's a consequence of looking at the world on much larger scales than fundamental scales. And we'll see. <laughs>